Hello and welcome to Podcast Property. My name is Tom Webster. And I'm Rob Holmes. And today we had a fantastic guest, as always, giving you the very best in the property game. So a little while back, I don't know whether the whether you remember I did it, well, me and Rob did a episode where I went over my experience in serviced accommodation, the good, the bad, and the ugly of, of said service accommodation. And and there was some very ugly in there. <laughs> so what we thought we'd do is we would do the counterbalance of that. So you kind of got a good idea of what's what. Um, but actually, before I actually, do you know what? I'm going to rewind a little bit before I introduce the guest. I want to say a quick apology for missing an episode last week. So, we were actually really let down by a potential guest. So, someone had confirmed they were going to come on on the Sunday. I did send them a message in the evening asking if they were good for tomorrow, and they said yes. And then on the day, they just literally disappeared and ghosted us. We got, we got ghosted, didn't we? We got completely ghosted. So, so unfortunately, there was no episode last week, and we are, I do fully apologize. Um, but while I'm on that same train, this will actually be the last episode of this season because Rob and I are going to take a short break. Um, we've got, to, to be honest with you, there's just so much stuff going on uh, project-wise that we just needed to focus on a couple of other things and then we're going to bring it back in, the, in about a month's time or two months' time. But in that period of time, please, please, please do email us with any suggestions, mm-hmm. any guests you think would be great, any sort of any feedback if things have better things are worse things have changed or anything like that just please give us some feedback we would love to hear from you because like i said before this podcast is kind of a one-way street that we put stuff out there and it's very rare that we get any sort of feedback back Mm. so anything you can give us back would be amazing just visit the website podcastproperty.co.uk our email addresses are on there and you'd be literally helping us massively so thank you so thank you in advance and to add to that what would be really good is if you are listening and you you've got someone you would love to hear on the podcast just, just send us a message who it is and, and why you think they'd be great on the podcast and we'll, we'll reach out to them. Or if you've got like a certain strategy you want to learn about or, or a certain kind of sector within property that you want us to talk about, we'll go out there, we'll find a guest that, that is in that sector and, and we'll bring them on the show. Yeah, definitely. We want to make, as everyone knows, this is all really conversational. It's all really lighthearted. So it's just whatever you guys want, we will try and deliver and we'll do it the best, the best we can. So please, all the feedback is greatly appreciated. So rewind. So if, if I had a little uh, editing suite now, I'd make some sort of like <laughs> noise. <laughs> um, so we had a chap called Rob Mason on today. So Rob, like we said, is the counterbalance of my good, bad and the ugly of service accommodation, where Rob has been very, very successful in service accommodation. So he started off on a rent to rent and now he's in management and it's literally he lives and breathes service accommodation and his growth over the last three years has been compounded and the trajectory is huge and i think did he say something like he's doubled in the last three months so he was up yeah he was up to something like 30 units by january and in the last three months he's doubled that so so a really good person to hear from he's got history in um travel and in uh, hospitality so he had that mindset which i think's played really well but again we go in some really good conversations about his history and, and what what he's learned from that we also talk about some of his failures as well. So we, so he's a very entrepreneurial person, which again, we all love having on the show. And he explains he was one of the kids in the playground, as I suppose most of us were, selling sweets and selling magazines and all that sort of stuff. And he always knew that he had this entrepreneurial bug in him. And and we talk about some of the failures that he's had, which I actually thought was probably one of the like, really, really interesting parts of the show. Um, anything you want to add in there? Yeah, I, he... He goes kind of really deep into different things such as, you know, cleaning, commissions, um, you know, sourcing property, set up costs, uh, what you should be looking for in a, in a managing agent um, and all of that sort of stuff. Uh, and actually off, off camera and off recording was really interesting because once we'd finished, I just kind of, I threw a property that I own at him and said, look, you know, this is in Brighton. Do your thing and, 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 and what do you think we would make? Um, and it was really interesting to see someone do the same kind of calculations very quickly, kind of fag packet that I would do on, for instance, a buy, refurb and refinance. You know, so I do the what is the purchase price? What is the refurb? What is the finance cost? What's the end value? Is that here's the profit? And, and he's looking at, right, well, your your management plus that will be this Your you know, uh, online booking dot com, Airbnb commissions will be this. Your clean will be this. Um, in the week you'll make this in the weekend you'll make this and he was online on the other end of the screen doing it all researching brighton and what in about six or seven minutes tom he came up with you know my low end profit per month and my summer high end 
high booking cost profit per month. And I was sat there like, when, when, when can you take the keys? <laughs> <laughs> that was really interesting. So I really like that. Yeah, no, he's a really knowledgeable guy. I think people are going to really enjoy this episode as we did. Um, what we'll do is uh, get started, I guess. <laughs> if you want to follow us, you can at Podcast Property on all the socials. But like I said, please do reach out. We do really want to hear from people while we take this little hiatus. Um, so please do get in touch and enjoy the show. Anything you want to add? No, let's go. <laughs> you don't want people to enjoy the show, Rob? Well, they, of course they enjoy it. They're, they're yes, they do. That's why they're in. Dulcet tones. How could they not enjoy it? <laughs> good morning, Rob. How are you, mate? Yeah, very good. Thank you. And you? Yeah, very well. Thank you very much. Lockdown treating you well? Yeah, we yeah. have. Can't complain. It's, uh, <laughs> yeah, not as easy as uh, as it was before, but um, yeah, we're battling through, mate. We're battling through. A bit of a light at the end of the tunnel now, though, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> definitely feeling that way. Well, we've got <laughs> pub gardens in two weeks or something like that, isn't it? Is it? I haven't I think so. Is it April 12th? That. Not that I'm counting. <laughs> <laughs> I know that's the day we can accept guests again. So that's the day I'm looking forward to, to accepting uh, measure guests again. <laughs> oh, fantastic. Um, I, think, so, I think when that pub garden opens, they are going to have to drag me out kicking. It's just going to be like the Wall Street. I'm not leaving. <laughs> <laughs> so, Rob, the way we like to start the show is we like to ask our guests to introduce themselves, just kind of give us a flavor of who you are, what you're doing. Um, like I said, you go all the way back to childhood and give us a real good understanding of sort of your life journey. And then we'll just build the conversation from there. Superb. Yeah, sounds great. So, um, so yeah, I'm Rob Mason. I was born in Yorkshire. Um, and where do I start? So um, when I was in school, I always wanted to be an, uh, a business owner. I always wanted to be, you know, the guy in the suit on the phone sort of doing the deals. And, and that, that was always, always what I wanted to do. And um and I started as early as I could. I was selling posters in the playground and um, sweets out of my school bag and working down on the market store when I was probably about seven or eight. Um, I used to think it was great. I used to get five pounds a day um, and I'd go and get uh, a CD at lunchtime. Remember when you could get singles? Remember that? Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and, um, and I thought it was a great job in the world, haggling with people in the market stall. Um, everybody around me was like, this is ridiculous. He's been paid five pounds a day. That's, that's, um, that's not right. Um, but no, I've always, always been that way inclined. Um, and when we were, when I was about 12, 13, something like that, um, my dad was running a big travel firm at the time, and a couple of his counterparts in similar positions um, sort of dropped dead of heart attacks. Oh, God. And he was like, my God, if that's what's in store for me, F that. Um, so we moved to Spain. He was like, right, let's, let's change everything. Let's, let's go and find something different. And um, me, my sister, my mom, and my dad all moved to Spain. Um, so I finished my education there, thankfully, in an English school in Spain. Um, probably got much better grades than I would have done if I was here because um, I was very mindful of the astronomical costs. Um, and then I started working bars and restaurants and stuff like that there. Um, again, I had some little businesses there. I had a um, business called Pocket Maps. Um, so, yeah, it was paid for by advertisers, and then we made the money off selling the maps. Um, at this point, I must have been about 17, something like that. Um, and then a bit later down the line, um, we did sort of stag do stripper cruises um, <laughs> on a private yacht now we're talking <laughs> uh, <probably> about, but, <laughs> yeah when i was about 19 i was absolutely living the dream um we only managed to get a couple of, of, like to actually go out but we made really good money on those couple of cruises we did um so i've always been always been that way in time trying to make um make something of myself um, and always trying to start a new business venture one way or the other here and there. Um, then I moved back to the UK when the, the, the economy crashed. Um, my parents managed to sell up their supermarkets and we moved back. Um, and I moved into a, a travel firm. Um, travel's always been in, um, in the family. My dad's always been in travel for, for 40, 50 years. Um, and he said, look, there's a job here if you want it. It's the bottom of the pile. You're not going to get any special favors. It's in his, uh, the company he was working for. He said, if you want to do it, come in. Don't expect anything extra. Um, work your way up from there. Um, and within about two years, I was uh, running the marketing team. Um, so we had a, I think I had like a 1.2 million pound budget, needed to bring in 30 million a year, uh, which was a bit of a challenge for a 20 year old, 20, 21 year old. 
Um, but I really enjoyed it. I really enjoyed it. And I gave my absolute heart and soul to it. Um, and then I lost, I, I, I lost interest over time. And I, I just got bored, like more and more bored um, to a point where I just couldn't be asked at all. So I thought, well, I need something new. I need something fresh. Um, I've done a lot of sales in the past and a lot of sales jobs. And so I moved into a luxury travel firm um, in a sales role. The idea being is, if you're going to sell something, you may as well sell the very best. Um, <laughs> you can really get behind that. <laughs> and equally, if I'm going to go and experience any of it, I don't want to be doing it on the cheap stuff. Let's go and do the expensive stuff. Um, so I moved into this luxury travel firm where uh, my average booking was like 20 grand. Um, my biggest booking was half a million quid for 10 oh, days. Go on, Enzo. Um, wow. Enzo yeah, 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 stop, yeah, stop, stop. <laughs> More on that right thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, so obviously I can't say who it who was. was it? But, um... Who was it? And do, they want, <laughs> do they want a sugar baby? Because, you know, I'll shave my beard. I'll put some makeup on. <laughs> You'll do what it takes. <laughs> yeah, I can't, I can't say who it was for, but it was... Um, it was a, a, a multi-generational family. It was grandparents, uh, kids, and grandkids. Um, there was eight or ten of them. And they were flying private jet from the UK down to South Africa. Um, they were spending some time in Cape Town. Then they were flying up to Botswana, um, which is like, I can't remember now, it's such a long time ago. It's like a couple of hours flight. And I was like, well, it's a couple of hours flight. And later on, um, they were like, hold on, have you put us on like a plane with other people there? And I was like, yeah, because it's going to save you like 25 grand. And they were like, right. <laughs> just put us on the, on the private jet, please. <laughs> I was like, oh, okay. I, I just thought I'd save you the 25 grand. They were like, we don't care about the 25 grand. Get us a private jet. Um, it was completely mind-boggling, the, the, the whole sort of way that they thought. Um, so they went off to, uh, they were flying up then to Botswana, out into the Okavango Delta, and out into the Makadi Kadi Pans, where there's these... Um, this amazing, amazing um, camp out on the on the um, salt plains. I might be wrong with that, um, but yeah, and it's like really rustic. It's been there forever. It's incredibly well known. It's a camp, camp called Jack's Camp, um, and so they were going there, and they were going up for a safari in, in South Africa. They got to this place, and because it was so rustic, this place in, in Botswana. They absolutely lost their shit. Like, this is the worst holiday we've ever been on. We hate it. I can't believe you've done this to us. Um, and so they went, it got so bad, they charged their jet and flew home. They missed half their trip and they got nothing back. It was just wow. the, oh, the I love stories like that. <laughs> yeah. And you just think there's like a good quarter of a million quid there. You've just literally thrown down the toilet. Um, plus the extra 60 or 70 grand it would have cost them to get home on a private jet. Um, yeah. So, Why wouldn't you just so go to another country? Why don't you just, just carry your holiday on somewhere else? <laughs> yeah, I mean, you would have thought that, wouldn't you? You'd have thought, well, let's just move on to the next place and just do something a bit different if we don't like this bit. Um, but yeah, so I, I thought, well, if I'm going to move into, back into sales, let's, let's go and sell the very best. And so I was very fortunate and um, I travelled all over the globe with them. A um, couple of times I managed to get like business class flights and all the time it was five-star hotels and chauffeurs and all that sort of stuff. It was really cool. Um, and I was sort of sold into all of that. And, it, and it, it was as good as it sounds, but that was like one or two weeks a year. Yeah. Um, the rest of the time you're stuck in the office dealing with very difficult people. And um, you know, a bit of travel's a funny one as well, isn't it? Because you you hardly get someone ringing you up saying, I had the best time ever. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's ringing you up to moan about something. And so whenever you watch those, like the airport shows and you see someone just screaming at some like poor lady behind the like the counter, and you're like, just shouting is not going to make that plane go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, the, things, the things I came across were phenomenal. Um, I was... Uh, um, their duty manager a lot of the time. It was a way to earn some extra cash. And, and um, so I do this 24-hour duty manager. Some of the things we got calls about were just absurd. Um, we had somebody uh, ring and say that they wanted an apple. Um, I was like, well, why aren't you ringing the reception desk? They were like, well, we booked it through you. Can you sort it out? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, sure, let me ring the reception for you. <laughs> well, they were right then. They got, they got yeah. what they wanted. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we got the job done. 
Um, somebody else called and said there was a wheel missing off their luggage. I was like, okay, where are you? They're like, well, we're home now. I was like, it's like 10 o'clock at night. Why are you really me? <laughs> um, just some really bizarre stuff. Um, I remember I had a guy that he was out in the out in the mountains in Oman and somebody had passed away back home unexpectedly. And so he, we had to sort of coordinate this middle of the night, getting him out of the mountains, getting a flight organised, multiple connections, all in time to meet the funeral. I mean, the, the logistics that go is from these bizarre um, and less travelled destinations were, were fascinating. Um, but it was just a whole different world. It was just a whole different world of, um, of travel, really, beyond anything that probably most of us will ever experience. Um, so that was really enjoyable for a while. Um, there's a common theme here, isn't there? <laughs> um, I get I get bored at periods of time, um, and so I started looking at options. I started looking at options to to get out of there and to get into what I wanted to do for me and run my own business and do my own thing. Um, which brings me on to a company I founded called Night Games. Um, so Night Games is basically Tough Mudder in the dark. Oh, brilliant! Um, oh, nice. So so yeah, ten ten miles. Um, pitch black sort of seven eight o'clock at night in, in, the, in the winter um paintballs uh, like um what was it glow in the dark paintball snipers we had organized fire pits to jump over uh, all sorts of cool stuff that were, were made even better by the dark yeah yeah um and i sunk a lot of cash into it i wasted a lot of money on, on a lot of things that i probably shouldn't have um and we didn't even get the first event off the ground which oh, was no. crushing um i'm so sorry to hear that because that sounds like such a good idea yeah yeah i mean in theory it is but the 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 costs of operating an event like that were just way beyond what i i realized yeah Um, can we go into some lessons that you learned from that yeah please um lesson number one was look after the finances um that was the one thing i got dramatically wrong um when i started looking at it i looked at well what what are the what are the costs? So they say five grand for the country estate, um, somewhere to obviously hold the event. And then there was all of the, the event village type services, tents and um, toilets and all, all the people to run all that. And then there was the actual course itself, which all needed marking out. Um, then obviously all the health and safety stuff and the actual obstacles. Um, the obstacles I thought would be really cheap. I thought it'd be like, let's, build up some bales of hay, let's set some stuff on fire, let's get some paintball guns. I thought, let, let, we'll, we'll get all this in for know, five grand. Um, it wasn't anything like that. Um, I started meeting these obstacle builders, these people that have done this before for the likes of Tough Mudder. It turns out Tough Mudder spent half a million quid every time they set up a course. Oh, I was wow. like, I've drastically, drastically got this <laughs> wrong. <laughs> um, <laughs> so... Um, so I, I skimped and scraped and schemed and thought, right, what are all the different ways I can I, I can adjust it while still giving people a, a great experience? And I managed to bring the cost down to about 40K just to, to put the event on. Um, and I think we had about 20 at, at that point. We had about 20 sort of booked and money coming in. And, and that's where we were sort of, we were at the time. This was December 2016, I think. Um, and so I was like, well, the event was going to be in the March, I believe. Um, and so I thought, well, I'm going to have to make a fuckload more sales. <laughs> um, that's basically the only way around this. And this is where I made a, a, a catastrophic error. Um, I thought, well, after Christmas, between Christmas and New Year, nobody's got anything going on. Everybody's just at home, sort of kicking around. It's that dead time. Equally, everyone's got the best intentions. Like New Year, new me. Let's get fit. Let's get healthy. Let's shed a few pounds. Um, I thought there could not be a better time to give people some motivation and to sell something that that gives people something to aim towards. So I lumped all the money I had into Facebook ads in like a ten day period, and it didn't pay off. Oh um, man! <laughs> um, which was um, in hindsight, I think the issue was that it was it was in a it wasn't a necessary cost. It wasn't something somebody had to buy. And at that point, people have spent all their money. People yeah. have like lumped all their money into Christmas. They haven't been paid again yet. And I think, I think that's where I got it. That that was one of the big mistakes for sure. That that was that was the the thing that sunk the ship. Um, 
there was plenty before that, which might have stopped us going, getting it so badly wrong in, in the first place. But that was the final nail in the coffin. And by sort of 1st of January, everybody else was celebrating the new year and I was going, business is dead. Oh, <laughs> it's man. game over. Um, so that was a really, a really interesting lesson. Um, we should have tested that period. We should have tested it and ramped it up as, as we saw the results. Um, I would have argued at the time that we were too small to test, but that's, that's bollocks. Um, if you're going to throw all your money into something, just throw a bit of your money into something and see what <laughs> happens. Um, so, um, so no, it was a really interesting journey and, um, yeah, I learned some hard lessons there. Do um, I think I, it's always really interesting to go through failures because, yeah. because that, and again, hopefully most people listening and again, everyone sort of around this table is we all understand that failure is, is so common. Like I fail far, far more often than I ever succeed in anything like it, to, to an embarrassing effect. <laughs> but, but the thing is, is there where the lessons are, there where the nuggets are, and you're just going to become stronger and better moving forward, which obviously sounds like that's what's happened with yourself. Yeah, the, absolutely. The other thing with that as well is it, it, people have got to realise, those that are listening, that it's actually, it's okay to fail. It's actually a yeah. good thing. And I think that's a really important point because it's so bred into us that failing is bad, that people get so worried about failing that they don't even try in the first place. And also the, the other thing to say is that, you know, if you kind of live by the, I guess the mantra or, or have this always in the back of your head that if you're going to fail, fail small. Mm-hmm. And when you win, win big, you're always going to be okay. So as long yeah. as you fail, but you have your strategies in place, your systems in place, your backups, your stop losses, if we're talking about trading or whatever, that when you fail, it is only small and you learn very quickly. But when you win, you're going to win big. Yeah. Over the long run, you're always- well, you look at you look at the venture capitalist model. Like they yeah. literally write it in their plan of their failures. They they say, yeah. right, X percent is going to fail, but Y percent is going to succeed. And as long as Y succeeds the the extent we anticipate it to be, it will it will cover the cost of the losses. So so yeah. failing is part and part of of the whole process. Absolutely. And I think that the fail small thing, I think you're absolutely right. Had I failed small in that marketing period between Christmas and New Year, <laughs> um, I would have, I would have learned, I learned valuable lessons and I'd have maybe approached it differently with what cash I had left. Um, I, I also think fail fast. I think you've got to you've got to be ready to cut anything at, at a moment's notice. And I think that that's something that I learned there as well, is the moment you see things aren't working, you need to stop, reassess and try something new accept that as a failure take the lesson and move on um whereas i, I just spent 10 days with my head in my hands just watching <laughs> it go down the pan <laughs> um, which was um not productive or enjoyable <laughs> um so um so yeah so that was night games so night games failed um that, that was um interesting would you do it again out of interest no no I <laughs> definitely not no, I think actually the model is fundamentally flawed. I think the the, the model is fundamentally flawed. Um, Tough mudder are in serious trouble if they're not bust already. Um, I read something not long ago saying that despite they are by by far the biggest in the world, their revenues were in the I think hundreds of millions. Um, they were still hemorrhaging cash. So why why What's I don't I, I don't know. Model? That, um, I mean they. My gut feel is the event costs are so high. Um, marketing costs need to be very high. Um, they've gone with a high-priced, um, high-priced product to presumably try counteract the those two things: the the event costs and the marketing costs. Um, the repeat custom is is minimal. Um, a lot of people are going to see this as a one-off challenge. Yeah. Um, yes, you get. There's a very very strong group of like hardcore. Um, obstacle race enthusiasts and they will do it every weekend or they would have done prior to that lockdown. Um, there is a very strong group, but they are small. There's maybe, I don't know, 10,000 of them in the UK. That's a really um, interesting take actually because I've because i done a Tough Mudder and I've done a, something else, I can't remember what it was called, but you, yeah. you've you hit an L on the head. You, you see the, the keen ones that have got like the t-shirts with how many they've done and the medals and all that sort of stuff. But you also see a lot of people, like I'd say the vast, vast majority of people are dressed up as ballerinas. Yeah, collection, collections <laughs> of people fun. from work. Yeah. That's probably one of the most common ones. It's people from work doing it for a charity. Yeah. And you just know that that is a one-time thing for a lot of those people. 
yeah, it's proving proving to yourself and, and other people that you can do it. Yeah. And then you're like, I'm not doing that again. It's horrible. <laughs> <laughs> I got so we did the 10k one, and um, and after about 2k, my um, what you call them, my calves completely went solid, like oh. absolute rock hard solid to the point that I couldn't bend my feet. And I had to run the next 8K like pretty much on completely solid calves. And then every every so often they would loosen up a bit and I'd be okay. And then they would just Don't. go bang. And then and then luckily every time I went into water, it would calm them right down and that would buy me more time. But by the time I got to the end, I was like, Callum, I can't do this. He said, yeah. you got this? I was like, all right, okay, well, I'll finish it. But my <laughs> I'm in absolute agony. Yeah, they, they they are hard. They are. There's no two ways about it. Obstacle races are hard unless that's something you do a lot. Um, I remember my first, uh, if that first and only tough mudder I did, um, and I was similar. By two two miles in, I was dead. Uh, I was like like ready to throw up. Yeah. Um, and somehow I dragged myself down <laughs> the course. And I remember they, they give me a final kick in at the um, at the last obstacle, which is the um, the electric shocks. If you if you do yeah, yeah yeah yeah. Um, and I. I'd sort of weaved through all these um, these dangling electric cables and I got right to the end. Everyone was sort of cheering and one clipped me in the back and I went face first in the mud. <laughs> <laughs> me, me and Callum did that one and we were like, right, let's just run at it. Yeah, just that's do the other it. option. And, oh, yeah. you're like, oh, and he does, it knocks you to the floor and you've got to get up your knee and because it just <laughs> puts your whole body in spasm. But it, yeah. it, it is good fun. Yeah, so, um, so yeah, I think... It, I, I would never get back into that industry. I don't think it, I think it needs a radical change. Um, I don't know what that change is. And I think somebody, the, the person who figures it out stands to do very well from it. Um, because clearly there are people that want to do it. Yeah. Um, therefore the, there's a, there's a market. If there's a market, there must be a solution. Yeah. Um, I don't know what it is. Well, getting the bill <laughs> cost down from half a million might help. <laughs> that, that'll be a starting point. Um, some people have fixed courses. Maybe that's the answer. Um, so you build it once people come to you um, and it just stays there year round and you put it on every couple of weeks maybe that's a more sensible model for it yeah I I, I, I sort of uh, a friend of mine's got a beautiful house in in a forest and he's got loads of land and stuff like that and I was saying what you should do is build like what you should do (laughs) is 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 build like a like a almost like an obstacle gym and charge people to use it as a gym because a lot of people want to train for things like Tough Mudder, but you don't have really facilities in a gym. You can do a lot of it, but the actual, the monkey bars and the this and then that and the the rope swing, like those sort of things, maybe the actual, the the mechanics of doing it in in real, but there there must be a market for people, like I said, like that fixed position, running it as it is. That that makes more sense, doesn't it? Because the the costs are going to be, a setup cost, uh, yeah. like, like, like a capital expense at the beginning, and then it, there's there's a small amount of maintenance. It, it sounds better to me. Yeah. You won't be able to charge as much necessarily. Yeah, there yeah. are some obstacle gyms out there, like, like what you described. There are a couple, I think, in the UK. Um, I don't know how how they fare, um, but yeah, basically, no, I'm not doing it again. <laughs> not. That, 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 that Lessons learned. Fast. Move yeah. on. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so then. Then I got myself into a bit of a hole. I was like, oh, I was, I was really upset about it. Um, I was really upset about um, all the people who'd paid money and didn't get what they asked for um, because their money had been spent. We'd spent what we'd earned on marketing um, in the anticipation of earning more back. Um, so not only did, could we not put the event on, but we didn't have the money to pay people back either. So we had to liquidate the company, which was um, seriously unpleasant. Um, and it left me feeling like a massive failure. And I wasn't looking at it as objectively then as, as I do now. Yeah, of course. Cool. Um, so I carried on with the day job um, and I carried on selling expensive holidays. Um, and then and then I started getting the twitch again and going, I've got to do something. I'm bored here. Um, I'm miserable here, but I, I don't know what else I'm going to do instead. Um, and I started reading, reading up on property thinking, well, you know, one day when I've got some money, I could invest in property and maybe I could sort of build build up that way. And then like the first book I picked up was like, actually, you don't need any of your own money. There's other people out there that might want to invest with you if you're going to do the work or you're going to provide the opportunity. And I was like, ah, okay. And then and then I went head first into it all um, and read everything I could get my hands on, um, watched all the videos, joined all the Facebook groups, and just generally immersed myself for about 18 months or so. What was um, the um? What was that first book? I think it was 
multiple multiple property streams of income. It was uh, Rob Moore and Mark Holmes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And how did you come across it? I think I I don't know in the is, is the honest answer. Probably just found it on Amazon. I probably searched property investing and it yeah. was top of the list. <laughs> um so yeah so i started with that and then i picked up half a dozen more and read all those um and then i finally took the plunge and went to an event which i nearly didn't go to it was like the, the day before the event was in central london um it was starting at like nine so i'd have to leave home at like four in the morning um and at like eight o'clock the night before somebody invited me to go out i was like should we go out <laughs> <laughs> i was like i could couldn't i i could go out and I could just sack that off. I'll do it another time. Um, and I very nearly didn't. But I, in the end, I was like, no, I've got this thing tomorrow. I've got to be up early. I'm, I'm going to do that. They have a sliding um, doors moment. Yeah. You yeah. know, if, I, if I'd gone out that night, who knows Who knows where I'd be sat now? Probably not here um, is the reality. Um, but yeah, so I went to that event. Um, it was really, really exciting and, and inspiring. And naturally, there's a big set at the end. Um, now, I knew... Um, I knew of the speaker. I met um, one of his sort of private mentees a few weeks before at a networking event, and knew that he offered this private mentorship, this like um, like mastermind type thing, rather than just a training course. So the big sell at the end of the event was the training course, which naturally would lead on to on to mentorship. Um, but I called him at the back of the room and said, "Look, I don't. I, I just want to go all in. I, I want the whole the whole shabam. I don't want the the three day training. I'm not interested in that. I want a year's worth of mentoring." Um, let's skip so, this sales funnel and just get me to the final product. Uh, just, just give me the final product. Stop messing around. Um, and so, we, so we did. Um, and I joined them for a year. And the first three months, I went in every which direction. I went down HMOs, uh, which in my area, I believed, at, I believed at the time actually was saturated. Um, I looked at commercial conversions. Everybody likes the sound of uh, commercial conversion type returns um, and developments. I, I thought that would be great. Let's make a hundred grand in one go. Um, the reality being, with no money to, to to my name and no skin to put in the game, as it were, um, and working like nine to five when all the commercial agents were open, um, it just wasn't wasn't viable. There was lots of things in the way, but I wasn't seeing it. Um, so about three months in, I sat down with my mentor and I said, "Look." This shit don't work. <laughs> this, this doesn't work. Not, nothing's happening. I'm working my ass off. I'm not getting anywhere. Um, and he said, well, well, it does. So let's let us have a look at it again. Uh, and we put every every strategy that they taught back on the table. And we got to service accommodation. He was like, why are you not doing this again? I was like, I don't know. That rent to rent thing just sounds a bit dodgy. It just sounds like a bit of a scam. And he said, well, yeah, but what about, um, and, I, and I knew this to be true, what about the big hotel chains? Do you think they own all their buildings? No. Um, I know like um, the Four Seasons I used to work with at the, the, the luxury travel firm, one of the best hotel groups in the world, and they don't own their own buildings. So they, they call it by a different name, but it is essentially a rent to rent. Um, and once I, I'd repositioned that in my mind, I was like, ah, yeah, okay. And then SA is very much a, um, a hospitality and uh, hospitality strategy more of a property uh, a travel business than it is a property strategy um and that's where my experience was so why wasn't i doing that so once i made that decision about three months in i i, I was like right no more messing around we're gonna have to make some progress here and we have to make it really quickly um so i came to the the next mentoring session the next uh, mastermind day with a bunch of questions how do i get from the idea to the first set of keys in my hands um, that's all I care about. I just want to get the first property. I don't care how, to, how I'm going to run it. I don't care where the bookings are going to come from. I just want to know how I'm going to get the first set of keys in my hand. I'll figure the rest out afterwards. And so I drilled this poor mentor um, all day. He was like stood in, um, I remember he stood in, in the queue for his lunch, the plate in his hand. And I was like, and what about this? And what about that? I just looked, it was like a dog with a bone. Um, and three weeks later, I picked up the first set of keys, um, which felt amazing. Um, and that was a week ago, three years ago, uh, a week and three years ago. Fantastic. Can you talk us through that process? Uh, the sourcing process. Yeah, just just your first deal, how it come about, what the if you don't mind going into figures. Yeah, no, and just no. A- um, so the first deal, so 
up until the point that I decided to go in service accommodation, I've been out there networking, trying to find not just deals, but money, um, because I didn't have any of my own. In fact, I paid for the mentoring on a credit card. Um, so I had bumped into, I'd, I'd um, been in touch with someone who had said, well, I've got some cash, I'll invest if you've got the right thing. So I was like, great, okay. So now I, now I just need to find the right opportunity. So um, once I'd had all this, um, this session with the mentor, sort of working out how to do the sourcing part of the process and how to talk to the agents and how to explain rent to rent and uh, what to look for in a property and all that sort of stuff, um, I started making calls. Every, every lunch break, I was on the phone. Um, every, every smoking break, I, I used to smoke. Um, I'm on the vapes now. I'm so <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but yeah, every time I nipped out the office for, for a cigarette, I'd be like on the phone speaking to agents. And I've, I've lined up, um, I think, six viewings for a Saturday in Birmingham. I went and got, I think most of them agreed to, agreed to give me them. So I thought, well, I could potentially take them all, and I thought, well, no, that's gonna that's a recipe for disaster. Um, let's, uh, let's, <laughs> Stop let's... going all in, Rob. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah there's, 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 a time, there's a time to go small. Um, so, so, um, so yeah, so I started small. I thought, well, let's get one, and let's run that one, and, and really fight against my nature, and let's run that one for six months. Um, let's learn all the lessons small, and then we'll grow, and then we'll really grow. Um, so we decided on the one deal. It was uh, just off Broad Street in Birmingham, a uh, two-bedroom apartment with uh, with parking, uh, one bathroom, I think it was. Um, it needed some work. Um, I'll come on to that. Um, but yeah, I think it was, I think it might have been 750 a month, um, something like that. So I worked it all out. I presented it to the investor. He's the most, he was, he is, he was and still is one of the most laid back guys that, um, that I work with. And he was like, yeah, sounds good to me. Um, I'll put the money in. You're going to do all the work. I want my money back before, like first, and then we'll split the profits down the middle. So it seems fair to me. Very fair. Um, and, and that was a great way to get in because, um, I mean, without him and the deal that sort of being there together at the right time, again, probably wouldn't be sat here. Um, so picked up the first set of keys and then I was like, right, what, what now? Um, and the place needed a bit of work. It, it had um, it smelt really strongly of curry, um, so I needed to clean all the carpets. It still smelt, so I had to paint all the walls, um, build all the furniture. It, it just turned into a mammoth task, and I was trying to do it as quickly as possible because I wanted to get it on sale whilst working my job, um, which was about an hour down the road. So I was like going straight from work at five o'clock working till two in the morning, getting up at six, doing a bit more, and then driving back to work covered in paint. And I did that all week um, and all weekend. And by the Sunday, my wife popped in to give me a hand finishing the final bits off. I, could, I couldn't even string a sentence together. I was that, that completely gone. Um, but we got it done, and I'll never forget the first bookings coming in. I just climbed into bed, and the booking came in, and I was like, oh, I'm booking! Yeah! <laughs> it's our first booking! And then literally five minutes later, another one came in. I was like, yes! It was, it was the greatest feeling. Um, and then from there on in, it was just like, it was just like, right, how do we build the systems? And then how do we, um, how do we start to look at scale? And then I ran it all completely on my own for a long time. And then we started to look at, at bringing in virtual assistants and it's grown quicker and quicker. Um, at the end of the first year, I think we had two. The end of the second year, I think we had about 12. Then we had 22. that right yeah and then 22 beginning of this year we had 35 um fantastic month, well done mate in the last 60 days um so it, what the, did you say in the last 60 days because we, we yeah, in, the, in the last 60 days that's doubled oh wow um, wow so it, it's and i think there's a lesson here there's definitely a lesson here because um Going back to what I was saying about like just do one for the first six months, and there's that that, that, that need to grow, and there's the, the entrepreneurial drive that makes you go, Oh, I just want to do more and do more and do more. <laughs> and actually, you've got to have a bit of patience, which 
I, I'm sure you guys probably feel the same. As entrepreneurs, patience is one thing we're generally in short supply. Yeah, big time. <laughs> <laughs> but what, what you don't realize, that it realize is the compounding. So where we were doing one deal and then we would focus for months on the next one. Um, now we're, 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 multi, we're juggling, I think juggling 15 setups at the moment. Um, and it's just like the, the faster you are, the bigger you grow, the bigger the growth gets. Um, I'm sure adding 30 units in five years' time won't feel like a big deal. Um, but at the moment, it does. The same as adding one unit did right at the beginning. Um, so I think you've got to sort of have that faith and have that patience, which um, is definitely easier said than <laughs> <laughs> um, So, yeah, that sort of brings us up to today, really. Today, we, um, we manage, once they're all set up, I think it will be 70. 273 something like that um currently in the um either already operating or sort of in the process of being opened um they're spread across i think 17 cities um we're we're having our best months ever month on month on month um last month we broke our target uh, broke our best month ever despite it being february this month it's 50 percent higher wow um i mean it's it, it's it feels like we, we've come out of the worst of what what we've been through um, with the coronavirus stuff, and we're heading on to better into better territory now. And um, are you so now still the, rent to renting, or are you buying your own units now? No, really, really good uh, point that I, I didn't mention. So I did the first one as a rent to rent uh, as a JV. Um, the second one was um, was management. Once I went down that, no, sorry, no, the second one was a JV as well. Once I'd gone down that route, I had two separate JVs with two separate people and two separate companies, and I saw where this was going. I thought, if I'm not careful, I'm going to end up with 100 companies with 100 different people. Yeah, and That's yeah. 100 sets of accounts to file. That my, my, <laughs> There's my, 100 problems to have. <laughs> yeah, my, God knows what my, my self-assessment would look like at that point. Um, it sounds expensive, and it sounds like a, an administrative <laughs> nightmare. So for that reason... Um, so that was one of the big reasons. Um, that was the biggest reason. Um, I decided to go all in on management. Um, and so I was doing the management and then I had these JVs as well. Um, I then decided to step out of the JV agreements because actually, um, what I didn't want is for there to be any, any question about where the, where the bookings were going. If I've got my unit here and your unit next door. There could be um, there could be a question about whether I was favoring one or the other. I just want to take that off the table. So now we, we do management and management only. I don't have any of my own units, uh, which means we can be completely impartial um, and offer, offer the guests the choice. Here are the properties we've got. Here are the prices we're charging. What, what would you like, Mr. Mr. Guest? So, um, so no, now we're a management only model. Um, we operate fully hands off so that Many of our, uh, our partners that we manage for, I haven't spoken to in six months. Um, they get their deep, their statements through, they get cash through every month, and they're happy to leave it at that. Um, some of them I hear from more regularly, and that's just the difference in people work, in the way people work. So, um, can so yeah. you tell us? Can you tell us a bit more about um, what to expect from SA? Because just bringing it back to the reason you know we we reached out to get someone like yourself on the show was we've already done an episode where me and Tom were on and Tom was talking about his experiences, like a single SA, single operator, doing most of it himself. Okay. Yeah. And kind of <clears throat> his negative experience of it and why he chose not to continue with it. So on the flip side, you know, you're doing very, very well. You're doing things a lot bigger. What, what are the pros to service accommodation? What could people expect from, from you as a managing agent <clears throat> and, and not only what can they expect from you as a managing agent, if they're not using you, what should they be expecting to look for in, in when finding someone to, to manage their SA? What kind of profits is it is a good margin to make? Uh, what's the range, kind of the lowest you should expect to make and the highest, how quick you should be looking to get your money back? You know, One you question source, at a time, Rob. <laughs> do you source them? Let me just make some notes. <laughs> <laughs> Let's start at the beginning of that, Rob. Go. Yeah, right, Go. okay. Um, I, I've forgotten where we started now. Yeah, right, okay. what, what was the first question, Rob? We'll, we'll break them down into separate yeah, conversations. Yeah. So, so obviously, <laughs> as I was saying, Tom had the negative experience, right? Um, and decided to step away. So what is it that you can... Let's start with why it's great, Sean. 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so no, so I, I get it. And look, SA, I'm not going to sugarcoat it, can be a pain in the ass. Um, and that's why we exist. Um, a lot of people have a very similar experience to Tom and find for whatever reason, they, they don't like doing it themselves. Um, on a small scale, yes, you can make some money and you can make a little bit of extra money. But, um, and I haven't heard that episode, so I don't know quite what your conclusions were, but I know many people think, actually, for the sake of a few hundred quid a month, I'd rather not have the hassle. And I get that. I that's pretty much that. it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Is that what I was on the episode? Yeah, it's pretty much boys down to it. It's like, I was earning more money than I would have earned renting it out, but the work for that money didn't balance for me. Yeah, yeah, and I, and I completely get that. Um, if you if you manage it yourself and you don't necessarily have the experience of um, of being in the industry for a while or managing in different areas and being ready to adapt to different market conditions and different sales trends and all the things that could change um, and do change every week and month in, in SA, um, then you can't always get the optimal returns. As an independent host, you, you don't necessarily get the optimal returns. Um, as a management company, um, we should be getting you as, as near as damn it the optimal returns. Um, but the big thing that we tend to take away for people that, that have a similar experience to Tom is that we take away all the aggro. Um, and that, that's what makes it so difficult to, to operate a decent management company. Um, I mean, my phone, despite my best efforts to pass everything to my team, my phone goes off day and night, day and night, messages emails, texts, WhatsApps, Facebook messages. Um, it's constant. Um, and that's putting aside all the stuff my team do. Um, my uh, Our business line rings 20, 30 times a day with one thing or another, whether it be inquiries, bookings, chasing invoices. Um, it's a business. Um, it's not just a business, but it's, it's a business with lots of complexity. Um, whenever you put people in the mix, you find problems. <laughs> It'd be a lot easier without guests. Um, I'm, I'm thinking about restructuring to a model that doesn't include guests. I'm not. Yeah, that'd I'm, be good. I'm, I'm quite figured it <laughs> out. Can I have yet, the money like, without the people, please? <laughs> yeah, I, I could do with it without guests, and I'd also like it without properties. They are the two big pain points. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but no, but it is. I mean, the managing lots of properties brings you lots of maintenance issues and lots of just general property stuff that goes on. Managing lots of people's bring, bring, people brings you lots of people problems. Um, if you do it on a small scale, the rewards are small. If you do it on a big enough scale and you systemize and um, um, sort of put the right process in place, then you can earn good returns um, for comparative, comparatively minimal effort. Um, why we exist as a company is that... Like those, those kind of returns. So how much should a, a looking to get into SA, excuse me, <clears throat> how much should someone looking to get into SA be looking at putting into on the front end a property to get it found, set up, contracts in place, hand over to you? And then how much should they be looking at uh, making a month kind of on a typical deal? So, um, yeah, so set up costs, typically, if you're going to set up, uh, if you're going to get someone to source it for you, if you're going to get someone to source a rent-to-rent deal for you on a three-year term, you should be paying about three grand, about about £1,000 per year. That, that's about right. Um, once you've got the property, how much it takes to furnish is sort of how long's a piece of string. If it, if it was empty and it's a two-bed, three, three and a half grand would do it. Um, often they're part furnished. You might go for... Um, contractors therefore the property uh, the furniture is going to be a bit cheaper you might go for you might have a penthouse in central london and you might want to go for much more expensive furniture so that there's a, there's a huge huge swing from probably 1500 quid to 10 grand but i normal units middle of the market three or four grand would do it okay. um once you've got it set up um the again returns are going to vary depending on the area um, but if you were self-managing, I'd be looking for probably seven to twelve hundred pounds a month. So self-managing. Um, if you're going to get of, some of profit, yeah, yeah. So uh, yeah, that's uh, net profit of yeah, yeah, net your net profit, excluding tax, etc. Um, if you were going to get somebody else to manage it, I'd be thinking between five hundred and a thousand pounds a month would be would be my target. Now. 
all this needs to be prefaced by the fact that those those um, returns haven't been available consistently over the last year. Um, coronavirus has just created all sorts of uncertainty and all sorts of drama in the marketplace. Um, we've had some properties that have absolutely cleaned up and we've had some properties that have struggled from one month to the next. Um, that's, in some cases, the markets. Um, and I think this, again, is a really interesting point because... I don't know if you guys are in the service to come uh, on speak service to accommodation groups on Facebook, but you'll see these sort of feast and famine stories. Oh, everything's full. We, we, we wish we had more properties. We're making great money. And then there's other people like I'm handing back all my keys. I'm, I'm handing back three apartments. Um, and I think that, I think that creates a lot of, um, it gives the wrong impression. The people that are handing back their keys could potentially feel like they've that they they're to blame and, and it's their fault that it's not working. And the people that are doing really well could feel like they're they're kings of the world and they're doing incredibly well and they're incredibly smart and they're great and, it, and it's all all they're doing. And there's probably an element of both of those things. I'm not, not saying there isn't, um, but it's so defined by the market. Um, there's not many operators that operate in as many places as we do uh, that I know of. And so not many people see these, these different spikes in different markets the way we do. So when I started to see these stories, I was like, well, where are they operating? And I was like, yeah, that makes sense. And that makes sense. Contractor areas are doing well. Cornwall's empty um, through the lockdown. That makes sense. Um, so, um, so, yeah, so I think you've got, to, you've got to look at your market really carefully when you get into service accommodation. You need to know who, who's going to be staying with you. You need to know what your fallback options are. Um, at the moment, contractor demand is still strong and it's not going anywhere. If, if, if anything, contractor, contract demand, construction industry demand is higher than it has been um, for a long time. Um, a lot of them that used to use hotels are now thinking, well, actually, these apartment things are great. Um, we can cook dinner or get a takeaway and sit on the sofa is probably the more likely option. Um, but they've actually realized that there's a life outside uh, travel lodge and that actually by doing that, they save themselves a lot of money by not sitting in the travel lodge bar and having dinner and a couple of drinks each evening um, or many drinks each evening. Who knows? <laughs> um, if I was there, I know that's the way it would go. Um, so, yeah, so the contractor market is incredibly strong. The um, leisure market has is bouncing back. Um, but I think we've got to be careful about that too. Um, again, lots of people are saying, my phone won't start ringing, my bookings are through the roof, I'm 100% occupied for the summer. Um, and there's other people going, I'm not. Why? Because you're, you're not in the right place. Um, so I had someone call me the other day. They've got a property in, um, in Watford. They're like, I'm not sold out for the summer. Why? I was like, because you're in Watford. Um, <laughs> no one's and, packing and their kids up for it. A... <laughs> yeah. But Watford isn't that sort of destination. Um, you'll get contractors in, but you won't necessarily get tons of leisure guests booking their big summer holiday to Watford, obviously. Um, and so you've, you've just got to understand what your market is in the area that you're in and make sure you get into a market that you believe in. Um, my personal view is that the leisure market is going to be great for the next couple of years, much stronger than it, um, than it would ordinarily be. Um, because obviously people aren't going to be traveling abroad. Um, obviously, we're recording this 22nd of, uh, of March, and we've just had news in the last couple of days that actually summer holidays to Europe are seriously in jeopardy. Um, my bookings over the weekend have been through the roof. Um, now, that's to be expected. And I think the, the more blows that the, the, the airline travel um, get, get dealt, the better for the UK um, staycation market. Um, and look, yes, it's terrible for them, but we've got, a, it is what it is. Um, and if we've got an opportunity, we should be taking that. Um, in terms so, of, in terms of, um, just coming back to the sourcing yes. and what, what to expect to pay, do you actually source deals to people? I don't anymore. I used to. Um, the reason I don't anymore, quite honestly, is I just don't like doing it. Um, it's just a pain, um, calling loads of agents and, yeah, doing loads of viewings, traveling all over the country. Um, I do enough traveling all over the country as it is. Um, after, I, after we finish this, I've got a team meeting and then I'll be on the road till midnight. Um, that, that's, that's, that's what I'm trying to avoid. So, so no, I don't offer any sourcing myself. There are a couple of companies that, um, that I work with and sort of um, 
I, I will introduce people to them and I will give them a brief that I believe will work. So my view is, and this, again, is going to be very generalized and I don't want to tar everybody with the same brush, but a lot of sourcing companies don't know anything about the operations. They don't, they don't operate their own units. They don't know how it actually works. They just go, that's a nice property. I can get it for a bit of a deal. Therefore, it's, it's a deal. Do you want to buy it? Um, they don't necessarily know what they expect the market to do. They can't take a good read on what the rate should be. Um, they may not have considered um, what the, the customers in that area are likely to book or not book. Um, there are areas where you will sell out midweek all the time and your weekends won't really sell. Um, somebody that doesn't know the industry inside out and just knows sourcing might work on the expectation that your weekends would sell. So um, I work on the basis that a lot of sourcing companies don't have that knowledge. Um, whereas I do have that knowledge, but I don't really do the sourcing. So I've partnered with a couple of sourcing companies and I say that these are the areas I'd like you to focus in. This is what you can pay. If you can get a deal like that for this person I know, I will recommend to them that they should buy that deal from you. And it's as simple as that. Um, that makes sense. That's a, a really good way of doing it, I think, as well, because you're covering both bases. Yeah. You're finding a good deal with the sourcing and yeah. giving that deal the best chance of success over the next three to five years. Exactly right. And um, and ultimately, if it gets my endorsement, I'm the one that has to deliver it. Um, it. Almost always, they will do that and then they will bring it to me for management. So if I'm saying it's going to work, on, on my head be it if it doesn't, despite yeah. me being sourced it. So um, yeah. it works quite well. It, it gives it allows me to buy into the deal with them, as it were, um, although not, not physically, of course. And what about um, in terms of a managing agent? Obviously, you know what you can do. Yeah. What would your advice be to people listening when they're looking for a managing agent? What should that managing agent be able to do for them? And what should be Rob? As well? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they should be looking for someone called Rob Mason, my dear. If they, if they forget that, they've, they've really struck gold. Um, but if they did want to consider other people, um, for me, I've taken on a lot of units in the last year from other managing agents. So people that have got um, their properties, other people, it's not worked out. The, the two big, three big reasons, generally, property's not performing is reason number one. It's not, it's not generating the right revenue. Um, so you want to understand from your managing agent what they believe it can, it can do. And you want to see that supported with some, some, some evidence. So you might want to say to them, well, what else do you have in that area or what is in that area that's similar to what I have and show me their rates. Show me why why the rates that you're telling me are right. If I say I can get 120 a night, but the market's only showing 110 a night, it's just not going to happen. Um, in the very early days of, uh, of um, the business, I tried to tell the market what the rates were. That don't work. Um, the market will pay what the market rates are. It doesn't matter what you think. And I learned that lesson, again, the hard way. We, we spent a couple of months with a property that just couldn't get working. It turned out, the again, somebody had sourced this who didn't really know what they were doing, um, and they just vastly overpaid for it. So the property could never make money. I was trying to price it at a point where it would, and the market said, no, thank you. We'll go book something at market rates. So um, I'd want to I'd expect to see some sort of evidence as to why they believe that they can make it perform in the way they do. Um, because performance is, key, is, is metric number one. If you're making money, lots of other things will be accepted. Um, where we're making loads of money, our clients are all really happy. And even if there's something that goes wrong from time to time, um, they just go, oh, okay, well, we'll sort it when we can. And, um, and they're, they're much more laid back about it. Um, in, the, in the cases where we're not making the right money, that's where people start to get really agitated about everything else, naturally, um, as we all would, I think. Um, so then the second thing that you need to look at, um, and the second reason that people leave their management companies is transparency. You can't see what's going on. Um, they can't see whether there's bookings in. They can't see how much money they're making. They don't know why, why, the, why the costs are getting too high. Um, and if, if you're not making money or it's not performing in the way you expected, and you can't see what's going on, then you start getting really upset naturally. Um, and it, it feels really uncomfortable. As the person in that position, it's just like, oh, what's going on? It's supposed to be my business. They're just running the operations. I don't know what's going on. I mean, why am I not making any money? So transparency, I think, is crucial. Um, and the third one is communication. Um, you need to have a very clear and open channel of communication with the necessary parts of that business. Um, and that doesn't always mean the, the person who owns it. 
Um, in fact, in my business, I'm very much trying for it not to be me. Um, at the moment, or in, in the past, everything came to me, which is, is naturally the starting point in a small business. But as we start to grow the team now, actually there are other people in the business that would know more up to date what was going on with a certain thing than I would. And so we're trying now to, um, what we've done is we have Slack. So we have a private channel in Slack, which is a bit like WhatsApp for anybody that doesn't know. Private channel in Slack for every property with the property partner in it. It's the person who's brought the deal to us. Um, they can ask questions in there and the whole team can see it. And whoever is most, um, most capable of answering the question will. And if nobody else can answer it, I'll jump in and answer it. Um, making sure that they've got that open line of communication and they can reach someone when they need help is, is really important. Um, there's some real horror stories that I've come across, people that haven't been able to contact anybody in their management managing agent's company for months, believe it or not. They've, they've not had any contact for months. They've not had any money for months and not have any statements for months. Um, it's like they've just stolen the property and kept the revenue. Um, so there are some real horror stories out there. I would definitely look for, look for recommendations. Um, I might even ask to speak to one or two of their clients. Um, any decent managing agent would happily do that as long as their clients are willing to. Um, so yeah, that's probably how I'd approach it if you decided that, that going to me, me straight away wasn't the right idea, um, which it is. Have you ever turned a property away? <laughs> have, you ever, have you ever seen a property and thought, you know what, that's just not suitable for service accommodation. I can't take your money. Yes. Definitely. Um, we've, I've turned away on lots of properties. Um, I, I've turned away on lots of properties that I knew immediately I shouldn't take on. And I've taken on some properties I knew I shouldn't have taken on. Um, and in most cases, I live to regret it. Um, in the cases, I, there was one recently, that, and that's what sort of sprung to mind. I was taking these two properties from another managing company. Um, it had gone south in an unbelievable direction for them. Um, they, they, they don't exist anymore. Um, the poor lady that brought them to me was in severe, severe financial trouble because of what, what had happened there. Um, and so I said, yeah, I will fix it. I will help you out. I'll make it right. I, I don't know how long it's going to take because of the amount of money we need to make back, um, but I'll do everything I can. And then I walked in the properties and they were the worst properties I've ever walked into. I was like, oh my God, what are we going to do? Um, I sort of wandered around with my head in my hands thinking, I shouldn't have said yes, but equally I can't leave this poor lady in the position she's in. Um, So I spent most of January evenings and weekends in these two properties, two four-bedroom houses, renovating them top to bottom, refurnishing them, getting them back to where they needed to be. Um, And now they're starting starting to look really promising. Um, so yes, there are definitely cases where I've turned properties away. Um, and there are definitely cases where I've t- taken properties I shouldn't have. Um, there's only been one case where I, I've actually turned a client away. Um, I took a client on recently, um, four or five months ago, and the husband wanted to use a managing company. They wanted to do every, they wanted nothing to do with it, Rob, fix it all, just make us some money. But he hadn't consulted with his wife, who actually quite wanted to get involved in a lot of it. And um, it wasn't until the property was open that she she sort of came into the frame and explained where she was at. And I was like, ah, you want to do a lot of the stuff that we do, and that will make it incredibly difficult for us to do our jobs. So we tried our very best to try and find a, an arrangement that would work and where she sort of had control, but we were still managing it. And it just kept getting more difficult and more difficult. And so... In the end, I, I had to pull a plug on that one and said, look, I'm going to have to give you it back because we can't half manage it. Um, and so I gave them, gave them 30 days to sort of get everything ready so they could take over and, and we handed it back. I think we actually gave them a little bit longer than that. Um, but yeah, we've only actually um, sort of set, turned one client away, one existing client away. So, um, yeah. Sometimes you have to do that though, right? Sometimes yeah. you it's have key. to turn people away. Yeah, I think... Yeah, it's, it's that, but going back to that failing, failing fast thing, I think you, when you can see that something's clearly not working, I think you've got to address it. And um, in the early parts of the business, I, as much as I was aware of that mess and I hadn't fully embraced it, um, and so, so in this particular situation, we weren't far into the, the arrangement when I was like, actually, it's definitely not working. We've tried a couple of, of remedial fixes and they've not worked. We're going to cut, cut ties immediately. 
Yeah. Um, Square another, pig, round hole. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, another good one for that, and particularly in, um, for service accommodation, is cleaning companies. Um, oh, don't even get me started on that one. <laughs> yeah, you got to listen Calm back down, to the Tom. podcast we did. Calm down, Tom. <laughs> I'm going to get him. I'm going to get him. <laughs> um, You've started him off now, Rob, mate. Like 20, you know, minutes, 20 minutes complaining about the cleanliness of a tap. Yeah, it sounds like you know exactly what I mean. And look, cleaning is so important. And because our cleaning companies are so important to us, and because we operate a remote model, um, and rehiring and retraining them is painful. We let things slide for far longer than we should have done in the early parts of the business. And cleaning companies will make a few mistakes and be like, oh, it's, it's okay, we'll, we'll tell them to do better. Um, and the mistakes would happen time and time again. <laughs> and and you just we just keep letting them off. And we keep going, oh, well, give, it, give, us, give us the cleaning. Uh, don't charge us for that clean. We'll give it to the, the guests and we'll say no more about it. And we, we let things like that go way too often. Now it's like, if, uh, the second that I know that they're not going to be right for us, they're gone. Yeah. Um, as soon as I'm sure, and that's not to say you make one mistake and you're out, because I, I'm, not, I'm just not a dictatorship. <laughs> um, but, um, but it's as soon as we've reached that threshold, we're like, actually, these are not the right company for us. They're gone straight away, um, which is painful um, and unpleasant sometimes. But it's the right thing to do, and I, I think I so wish I would have done that. <laughs> if, uh, for anyone that hasn't hasn't listened to, to the the show that I did about my experience, is every time I gave feedback to my cleaner, she had a go at me. <laughs> <laughs> I've got some. I've had some like that. Yeah, sure. so I'd be like, oh, just to let you know that the 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 guest has complained about this, this, and this. And then I would get an email like, as long as your arm going, well, no, because of this, and no, because of that, and I'm going, I'm going. I don't really care. I just want you to just do better. (laughs) And after about the third one, I then had to really just write a really like crappy email back going, look, I've had enough of every time I give you feedback, you get defensive. I don't care about your excuses. I just want you to sort it. And the the, the problem I had is because I I was actually selling the property. So I was doing service accommodation for a bit longer than I needed, uh, than I sort of planned for because um, the, the sale just took so long. So it was always in my head. It was like, well, it's okay. It's only a couple more bookings and then there'll be another delay. In it. And, it, and it just kept going and kept going. And I'm, I'm like six, seven months in, I'm like, I'm still here. <laughs> yeah. I, I can see how when you've got some, you've got your sort of working, haven't you, at that point? You've got to clean, the, the cleaning is being done. It's exactly not being done that. the way you want it necessarily, but it's being done and you're like, well, I'm nearly out of this. So it's pointless rocking the boat. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that's exactly what it was, 100%. Um, I think there'll be a lot of people that resonate with that. That, yeah. that resonate with the sort of cleaners that aren't performing and sort of feeling like, oh, it's easy just to maintain the status quo. You get the better, the better the devil you know sometimes, don't you? And you think, well, if yeah. I, I've got to find a new one, I've got to go through that whole process and you sort of do that, but you think, actually, looking back, hindsight, that was a bit of pill that I should have just swallowed early. And, and it Save was really so early. Because and I, I didn't tell this story last time, but the clean, <laughs> cleaners that I got in for the house, they cleaned our actual residence for, for yeah. one time. And, <laughs> and me being a bloke, I've walked around and I, oh, it looks fine. And then my girlfriend, <laughs> Emily, walks around and she's literally pulled it apart. She's found dust here. She's found cobwebs there. She's found that's not been touched. And this was apparently the first deep clean. So they do this, oh, like gosh. they call it the deep clean and they come in and then they, they use it as a starting point. And again, and Emily wrote this massive email explaining all the bits, and she wrote an email back going, "No, no, no!" Oh. <laughs> so I should have known straight away. <laughs> yeah, you, when when you get self get defensive cleaners, it's so much more difficult. Um, yeah. So just just take it on the chin. Just pretend that yeah. I just look. Call me a twat behind my back, but tell me that it's all fine and just pretend <laughs> yeah. that you're going to fix it. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> um, right, we're yeah. taking so much of your time, Rob. So we'll, we'll yeah. say goodbye here. So how, how do people get in touch with you if they want to get in touch with you and follow your journey? Uh, best way to get in touch with me is Facebook. Um, so find me on Facebook, Rob Mason, um, and drop me a message. Um, yeah, definitely. Cool. We'll add all the links into the um, podcast bits and bobs. Rob, I've got one more question before we finish. Go yeah, on. please. Is it one question or is it five? <laughs> <It's> <laughs> one. <laughs> Do you know what? I did get carried away, didn't I? You <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's not actually for Rob, it's for you, Tom. Go on him. Considering how you felt on the last podcast and doing this podcast now, having spoken to Rob, professional managing agent, do you think you might 
do SA again if you had someone like Rob looking after you. A hundred percent. I would want a hundred percent because I even looked into management companies when I did mine. Um, but the 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 rate that the one I only found one of them to be fair because because I'm in Eastbourne and surprisingly considering it's a holiday destination there are no management agents really marketing heavily that look after Eastbourne so I found one that was in that, that Brighton and they were going to do Eastbourne as not a favour is the wrong word but it'll be new to them but the rates they come back with were just ridiculous I don't know it's obviously because it was out of their comfort zone. So that's why I said, you know what, I'll just do it myself. It's not overly complicated to just answer messages and arrange cleaners. Yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually massively complicated. How hard could it be? <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's exactly it. But no, a hundred percent. If I could, if I could have found a decent managing agent that charged a fair price and did a good job, then a hundred percent, I would have carried on with it. Cool. That answer your question. <laughs> Yeah, it does, yeah. <laughs> okay, so we'll wrap up there. So thank you so much, Rob. What would like I said, we'll put all the links into, into the podcast captions and stuff so people can follow you. If you want to follow as you can, we're at Podcast Property on all the socials. Visit the website, podcastproperty.co.uk, so you can view previous episodes. And as you know, we are now on YouTube as well, so you can get to look at all of our pretty faces as we have these very fascinating conversations about property and all that property has to offer. Um, but no hope that you enjoyed the episode thank you so much for joining us and again thank you Rob and enjoy the rest of your day mate All right, see you later thanks so much thank you for listening to the Property Investors Podcast the information contained in the podcast is not to be used as financial advice everybody's situations and goals are different and you should always complete your own due diligence on investments and seek personalised financial advice from a qualified person feel free to contact the show for professional recommendations Visit propertyinvestorspodcast.com.